Hey everyone, welcome to the April 14th MakerDAO community call. My name is David Utrobin. Uh, I work uh, at the Maker Foundation doing community development and I have the good pleasure of uh, hosting these calls week to week. Uh, and so if, uh, if you're new to MakerDAO, uh, we typically use these public calls to go over uh, kind of the week in review. Uh, we go over the stuff that's happening in governance, uh, integrations that are happening, interesting stuff in the community that's happening uh, in a non-quarantined world. We like to go over events if we have time. Uh, and we get to kind of uh, get guests on the call and see interesting things that are happening, talk about current events, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So today, uh, we are gonna we do have a guest. Uh, the, the awesome man of the hour is Charles St. Louis. Uh, he's uh, also an employee at the foundation, and uh, he and Rune uh, have put in a colossal amount of work in the recent um, proposal for uh, the maker improvement proposal process. Uh, it's a little redundant, sorry. But uh, Charles is here, and we're going to talk about uh, MIP0, which is dubbed the, Gen the Genesis uh, MIP. Uh, and it covers all of the process and uh, format and uh, a couple of... Uh, of special uh, sort of processes in the sub proposals within that uh, MIP. So I'm going to give it over to Charles, and he is going to kind of introduce what MIPs are, give a little introduction about himself, uh, and we can get into it. And uh, and just as a reminder, this is a, a totally open call. Uh, feel free if you're here to hop on the mic, ask questions. If you don't have a mic, feel free to type your questions in the chat. Uh, I'm happy to read them out for you. Uh, and so, yeah, with that, uh, I'm going to give it over to Charles. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, so I guess before I start, I can give a brief introduction. So I work on the engineering general team at the Maker Foundation uh, with Water, And lately, I've been kind of responsible for getting the MIPS framework and the self-sustaining Maker initiative kind of kickstarted. And there are, were a couple posts that I'm sure maybe some of you have seen. If not, I can share after the call. Basically kind of announcing what's going to go on during this self-sustaining initiative and what that means for the Maker Foundation in a few years to eventually dissolve and how we can lay the bricks uh, to make that happen in the best way possible. Yeah, that's one. So before I actually get started with MIP0, which is basically the process that highlights this whole maker improvement proposal framework. I'm just gonna drop in the link for it on GitHub as well as on the forum. I'm not sure if, if that's one David shared or not, but. Yeah, and actually I'm also gonna share a link to the agenda for the call. So uh, you guys could find a ton of good stuff in there. Perfect. Well. Cool. Yeah, so basically all these MIPS, before I get started walking through the actual uh, proposal itself. These MIPs are all up on GitHub, and as of now, that means that the 13, 13 initial MIPs that we have proposed are under official review. So I'll get into the statuses of what it means through a life cycle of a MIP. But basically, this means that the MIPs are up for review by the community. They can propose any suggestions or additions or deletions, and then the authors of these proposals can basically decide if they wanted to accept it or not, or kind of gauge community sentiment and just kind of make sure that everyone's kind of happy with how it looks. And then it goes up into the governance where it actually gets formally approved or not. So that was just some context I wanted to provide before getting in. I'm gonna share my screen and do, instead of walking you through a, a GitHub page, I decided to build a brief presentation highlighting the major components as opposed to just scrolling through a GitHub doc. More digestible. Exactly. Okay. All right, so I'm hoping everyone can see this. All right, yeah, perfect. I can see it. So the brief agenda for this, I'm gonna try to keep it as short as possible due to the interest of time and other people and other topics on this call. But the main agenda is just a brief introduction to the other pillars of the self-sustaining maker in initiative alongside the, the MIPS framework itself, a brief introduction to the MIPS framework, and then the actual walkthrough. 
And then at the end, we can open up for some questions about MIPS in general. And I'd also like to provide just a note on the timeline um, over the next couple of weeks with respect to getting these proposals actually ratified. So the, the main core pillars that Rune highlighted, I think a couple of weeks ago on the governance call was that long run governance is very critical to MakerDAO success. And this can come with three main tools that we think. So the elected paid contributors and domain teams. These are individuals who can work on specific tasks or projects and are paid by the protocol. And more specifically, you can think of domain teams as groupings of EPCs, although they have different kind of um, administrative rights with respect to governance. The focus of today is the maker improvement proposals on how to affect change to the protocol and improve maker governance in the protocol over time um, through the backing of the community. And lastly, there's vote delegates, um, which will increase the amount of uh, MKR participating in maker governance, hopefully, that is. Um, but basically, it's kind of like electing a politician to vote in your favor type of thing. So with all of these three tools and systems in place, the goal is that it will create a fully implemented governance paradigm and allow maker to be that much closer to self-sustainability. So the MIPS framework, it's a tool to provide a clear and transparent process that allows both maker governance and the maker protocol to adapt and evolve um, through opportunities and risks and different events that happen um, over the course of, I guess, the next 100 years. So MIP0 is structured in a way that is standardized across all of the other MIPs that we proposed, as well as the general templates that people will use to propose their own proposals in the future. You'll have to bear with me with how many times I'm gonna say proposal throughout this presentation. But <laughs> the structure is there's a preamble, which is basically the syntax or formatting of the actual proposal itself. So it includes like the author, the pro the proposal date it was proposed and all these different things that I'll get into after. It includes a brief summary of what this proposal intends to do and then the motivation behind it. So why is this proposal needed? Why is it gonna make maker governance better? Why is it gonna make the protocol more self-sustainable or um, better for users? And then the most important part is the specification. So the details of the proposal. And in many cases, these specifications will have different components that explain and break down the actual um, proposal details and what it will mean for the future and how it will be broken down. So at the bottom of the slide, I, I said that this general structure is standardized, like I mentioned before, and it, it is followed in the general template that I'll get into later, as well as the technical template. So as I mentioned, the preamble is kind of a introduct and introductory and also administrative um, tool to help track the future MIPS down the line. But it includes the MIP number, the title, the authors, the type, which I'll get into later, the status, which is currently in request for comments, like I mentioned, the proposed date, dependencies, and what it replaces. So the last two are interesting because MIP0 obviously doesn't depend on anything, but the MIPs in the future may depend on a MIP before that. So in the, in the case of collateral onboarding, let's say there's the first MIP that is the application to onboard your collateral. So you have to post it onto the forums. And then the next step after that would depend on that one. So this is what we use in order to help track and um, help people navigate through these in the future. And then the replacement one, which I won't get into later because I wanted to not include all the components, just the ones that were really crucial, is basically if you're proposing a new MIP that will completely replace another one. So you have to indicate which one it will replace so that people can actually see the history or the change log of this process. This is the MIP zero summary. So as David mentioned, it is the Genesis proposal, basically describing the whole framework and do note that it is not final yet which I'll get into later. There's still a voting period and this current period of iterations and feedback that we'll go through. There's actually a ton of really uh, interesting suggestions on the forum. Yes, actually Long for Wisdom has already submitted them as pull requests. So I'm gonna start reviewing oh, those later today. 
Oh, cool. Yeah, so MIP0 is the, it highlights the core components and the statuses of all the MIP types and the overall MIP lifecycle, which is the best part of this MIP, is how these progress through their lives. Um, it also provides other tools such as templates, the replacement process, like I mentioned, and other dependencies. And lastly, it defines how to onboard, elect, and define a MIP editor as well as the govern governance facilitator with respect to how MIPs operate through governance. So I kind of already got into why MIP0, the motivation behind MIP0. So Maker is an evolving organization that will be fully decentralized and self-sustainable. And in order to further enable this gradual evolution, um, maintaining governance functionality um, is, is very crucial to that. And we think that with Maker improvement proposals, this will enable. So the purpose is to open up the ability to improve Maker governance and the Maker protocol to anyone in the community. It doesn't matter if you're technical um, or non-technical, it enables participation by everyone. So in order to, for these MIPs to be functional, they need to comply with a basic standardization process and internal structure. And we believe that MIP0 can shape that for the rest of the MIPs down the line. So these are the components of actual, the, the full MIP0. The ones that I've bolded are the ones I'm gonna go over today because I find that they're the most important and the others are um, easily, easily digestible, at least in my opinion. Are, are components uh, synonymous with <clears throat> subproposals? Uh, so basically, components are make the MIPS more digestible, and they are true to the core principles, which I'll get into, which is specificity. Um, but MIP components can have subproposals, yes. Um, I'll, I'll, I got it. I'll okay. try to cover that after. So I'm gonna. The definitions are certain definitions that we found should be included to kind of bring people more context and not get them confused and how to like increase the churn rate of reading MIP zero. Um, but feel free to look through them on the the GitHub page or the forum post that I posted. So the three core principles of MIP zero are specificity, completeness, and avoiding overlap. So in terms of specificity, this means that a MIP needs to define and address a single responsibility or behavior. So a MIP in general would therefore be rejected if it includes multiple ideas, multiple concepts, or multiple uh, things that could affect the protocol. And in that case, they would have to be split up into multiple MIPs. Second is completeness. So a MIP or a MIP set is complete if it has all the necessary and appropriate parts that cover a whole behavior and avoids being only a specific part of a greater whole. So I wrote that for MIP and MIP set because a MIP must be complete in its, in its own self. If it relies completely or is only partially covered with one MIP, um, it will be rejected because it just increases confusion and also in turn leads to overlap. But a MIP set in general is a grouping of MIPs that all cover one behavior. So for example, there's a collateral onboarding MIP set, which is six MIPs that cover the entire flow of getting a collateral type added to the protocol. So they're complete in their set. And this is one of the core principles that we need to follow in order to make the long-term clarity of these uh, proposals, but also to help governance and maintain it as well. The last one is avoiding overlap. So multiple MIPs, multiple MIPs should not be implement the same behavior, but however, they can be replaced. Um, so if a MIP is outdated or needs up or needs to be like completely replaced due to some sort of issue, you can actually propose a MIP to replace it. Next is the the next is the yeah, the MIPS life cycle. So this is the diagram that we created, although there was a really great diagram that someone from the community recently created that overlapped both the MIPS life cycle and the governance cycle. Yeah, Andy did it. I'll post the, the link. Yeah, it was beautiful. Definitely wanna play with that a little today. 
Um, but yeah, so in general, all these statuses are given to MIPS throughout their life cycle. Um, due to the interest of time, I did not include all of the descriptions of them. Um, but basically, each of these boxes or cir circular objects um, define what they're for and the criteria that needs to be met in order for them to move to the next stage. But in general, the conception phase is when the MIP life cycle begins and it is posted to the maker forums. The next stage of the life cycle is when it is formally approved by the MIP editor. So the MIP editor basically checks to see that the structure is correct, um, that it follows the template, it follows the rules in MIP0. And once that has been given the check mark, it can move on to the request for comments phase, which is actually where all the current MIPs currently rest. So this is the formal review period, which includes the feedback from the community and further drafting and additions of the MIPs to adhere to general consensus of the community. Um, although I do want to note that it is ultimately up to the MIP author to decide to implement these changes because it's their proposal. Um, it's their choice whether if they want to propose it as is, and it's then up to the governance cycle once it enters that to decide um, if it's adequate or not. The next status that a MIP can take is it fulfilling the feedback period. So there's a feedback period, which is the minimum amount of time that the community has to review this MIP. And there's also the frozen period, which is when the MIP can no longer be edited or changed and it is preparing for formal submission. Now formal submission is when the MIP authors actually submit the complete MIP after the review period and they submit it to the governance cycle by posting it to the forum Form, form category for formal submission. And at this point in time, it is up to the governance facilitator to go in and uh, see if the community agrees and um, the MIP is adequate or ready for the actual inclusion of the governance cycle. So this is where the current governance cycle and the proposed governance cycle overlap with the MIPS framework. So during the governance cycle phase is when MKR holders actually vote on whether to include this MIP in a governance poll and in turn lead to the last step, which is the executive vote. Now the executive vote actually ratifies the MIP or rejects it. Now the last, sorry, go I ahead. Have a, You're gonna I have a quick question about that. So if, uh, if an executive vote typically is used to like change like hard system changes like in the code, What's the purpose of having both a governance poll and an executive vote? Doesn't the governance poll already like ratify it? It seems redundant to me. Yeah, there are there are a couple other comments I think about that. Um, in some cases, there are technical MIPS that do require code and to be executed. Right. Uh, so and also it's more of a like formality and also really makes it certain that the community really wants this proposal to be voted in. Although, I mean, as I mentioned, the MIPS aren't final yet. So please actually add that feedback to the MIPS because if yeah, more sure. and more people add this, it may be justifiable to change it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's like, yeah, part of my main thinking was that uh, executive votes are, are kind of like the bottleneck for uh, for like hard changes to the protocol. So they should be like used minimally and, and only for actual changes. Like even now there's like this uh, uh, separation between monetary policy votes and technical changes. But then if you also add kind of like symbolic votes uh, that are just approving, you know, like MIPS, it kind of brings a lot of uh, a lot of activity to, to a tool with like low bandwidth. But yeah, I'll definitely uh, give my comment about that. Yeah, please do. And then, so yeah, the last status is uh, a formality on helping track and manage the MIPS in the future. But basically, it's the result of the executive vote. So the MIP is granted the accepted or rejected status based on the results of the executive vote. The next component that I wanted to mention is the idea of components and component types. So a component is necessary when, well, actually MIP components can, MIPS in general can have multiple components as you can see here. There's I think 11 in total, although four of them are 
pretty dedicated to the same thing, as I'll mention later. But so components are a way to categorize MIPS in general, um, depending on the logic in general, and they're named by their parent MIPS. So if you're creating a component, as you can see up here, uh, it'd be MIPS0, C4, and so on. And they can have different types. So a MIP component can be a process type, like this document itself, or it can be a technical component, which adds code or um, some sort of technical element that could require the other template that we'll see later. Um, but basically, it was a suggestion by a community member to better organize and format the MIPS, and it was a great suggestion, so we started implementing it for all of them. The next component is MIP templates. So we've created two main templates, and they do need to be reviewed, and they have been by the community. But basically, there's a general MIP template, which is used in this situation. So it's for process MIPS for um, a governance process or a, a standardized like, framework that could be used for collateral onboarding or something down the line, like maybe vote delegation or or that could be a tactical, it depends on how you see it. But it includes a preamble, a summary, a motivation, and a specification. Now the technical MIP is really interesting because it, it includes the same formatting, but the specification is extremely important here. And in many cases, if one of them is left out, there's it's very unlikely that the MIP will pass. So the specification for a technical MIP is the proposed code, which includes the executive code if the MIP eventually gets to that stage, any test cases, um, looking for edge cases, security considerations, which is the most important part. And it should be included as early as possible because looking at the certain potential issues with the code proposed is always best to do proactively. And in this case, you, you'd mentioned something like backwards compatibility. The last two elements are auditor information. So when you are actually proposing a technical change that involves code, you have to include an audit. And this section would include the actual report of the audit and the details behind it. And lastly, there's licensing. So if, if the code proposed, if the proposed code requires a license, you'd be required to list it there as well. So MIP0 is reliant on a couple roles. Now these can be people from the community or um, in the interim from the foundation. But the, the goal is that the community will eventually be able to run the entire MIPS framework by themselves. So there's two main roles. There's the MIP editor and the governance facilitator. So the MIP editor is basically enforces the administrative and editorial aspects of the whole framework, which means that they work with MIP authors proposing MIPS to make sure that they uh, uh, obliged to the standard and the templates. And the MIP author will also work with the governance facilitator on making sure MIPs are ready to enter the governance cycle. So as many of you probably already know, their the governance facilitator is nothing new. And they will operate voting front ends, run governance meetings. Um, and in the case of MIPs, they'll accept the MIPs that are ready to include into the governance cycle. Um, they'll also run calls to discuss uh, certain topics related to MIPS, um, contentious or not, during the governance cycle. I also wanted to note that MIP, so MIP component C8 to 11, uh, they cover the domain election and removal processes through subproposals. I didn't feel like including all of them there because it's quite redundant. Basically, there's components for how you elect a MIP editor or governance facilitator, the criteria that they need in order to be elected, although it does eventually depend on the actual maker governance participants. Um, but it's all done through subproposals. So I, I didn't really mention subproposals in detail earlier, but a subproposal is an instance of a MIP. So it basically, a subproposal framework within a MIP creates these mini processes that allow certain things to be done through the MIP. And it has less governance friction because the MIP that it runs under has already been approved or, in many cases, um, 
school. In many cases, it will be approved, hopefully. <laughs> uh, can sub proposals be like amendments to the original MIP? Yeah, so I'll show you an example of a sub proposal. So I didn't want to include this in, in the presentation, but in MIP C8, MIP 0 C8, the election process for a MIP editor, it describes the role of the editor itself. Um, it then describes the editor selection criteria. So a complete understanding of the MIPS framework, uh, experience with GitHub, familiarity with the inner workings of the maker protocol. Yeah, that's a bonus, but it would be nice. And then there's the election subproposal, which highlights the main requirements needed. So the subproposal feedback period would be three months, which means that the community has three months to review it and provide feedback on it. It's then frozen for one month, and then it provides the subproposal template, which is very similar to the general template, but it includes the role, the name of the applicant or proposed applicant. Now, we included both of those because not everyone's going to be self-elected. So I could propose David as a MIP editor, um, and it's not always going to be the person themselves proposing. The date applied and then the application form, which just includes the explanation as to why you want to become a MIP editor or why you want this person to become one. The credentials, so their past work experience, GitHub account, form account. It's great if they've been posted articles about Maker in general or DeFi. And then relevant information. So if you have those posts or you have those interests to back your personality or your character, uh, you can share them here if you'd like. So quick question. Am I right in understanding that uh, all of the elections of MIP editors would be uh, MIP zero dash sub proposal and then the number of the sub proposal? So everything, yeah. all of the elections and also the removals, right, are all sub proposals of MIP zero. Yeah. Right, so if cool. when I when I propose myself as the MIP editor, I'd fill this out and propose it as um, this or MIP zero SP one SP one and, yeah. and be it, and then it would state MIP editor uh, proposal or Got it. You, I mean as long as the title is specific enough. Got it. Although right. long long for wisdom and I are working on uh, standardizing pull request templates and um, the subproposal frameworks across all the MIPS. Um, so that does conclude the presentation. I'm sure I may have gone over my time, but before, no, before I open up some questions, I just wanted to note that the request for comments period for all of the, the MIPS, which can be found in this repository or on the maker forums are happening until April 27th. And on April 27th, there's going to be a timing vote, which has two options to immediately proceed with the ratification of these MIPS through a governance poll or to postpone out a month and allow competing proposals to be proposed by the community over the course of the month. And then it would pro proceed to the decision of ratification. And then after that, let's assume that the MIPS, the timing vote is approved. It would proceed to a governance poll, which would elect to ratify the MIPS over the course of May 1st to the 4th. And if that does pass, the governance cycle would begin on May 4th itself. And we'd start opening up all the MIPS to any type of category, any type of proposal, and uh, it'd be on its way. So Very that does cool. include my message. Very cool. So just uh, to clarify for myself, the uh, the timing vote is a forum uh, is a forum vote, right? Or is it also a so governance poll? It's a, it's a special governance poll. It's a special governance poll. All right, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. So if anybody has uh, questions or or uh, or like uh, good feedback or things that um, might have stuck out to them when. Uh, you might have read the MIP uh, before the call. Definitely feel free to throw some questions uh, Charles's way. Uh, I would love, uh, 
while people might be doing that, I would love uh, to get kind of uh, an idea of some of the uh, reception uh, of this MIP in the community. So you guys released it, uh, released this, the entire kind of framework and the initial 12 MIPs along with it uh, eight days ago. So in the last eight days, uh, what has been kind of the community response to it as uh, from your view, Charles? In my opinion, it's been really great. Like we, we saw feedback pouring less than 24 hours later. So the feedback has been really great. There are some that don't have as much feedback, but that's expected because they aren't as, I guess, big or potentially controversial. Um, but yeah, the main ones that have feedback are the one I just presented, so MIP0, MIP3, which is the governance cycle, which I briefly went over, not as much in detail as this, but last Thursday. And MIP2, which basically is a kind of interim solution for getting MIPS ratified and get the core governance framework and the collateral onboarding up and running. Um, and once that's done, it will resort back to MIP zero's logic. So it's basically this like bootstrapping of the governance framework proposal. Got it. But yeah, it's been great. So there is a question from uh, Akiva in the chat. He writes, <clears throat> what happens if a non-code uh, MIP passes, but people just don't listen to it. So I guess it's a question about enforcement. In general, um, the MIPS framework is meant to allow the community to self-organize and uh, create these processes for maker governance and the protocol to evolve over time. So if a MIP is not passed, I mean, if, the, if a MIP is passed and is not technically followed, um, there is a, a situation in which it would be become obsolete. Um, it would not be used, so why would it be there? And there's a time period for that detail in MIP0. Um, and assuming that if this isn't followed, there's another way to do it. So that could be proposed in another MIP, or it doesn't have to be in general. As long as this community is self-organizing and self-managing, um, that's the goal of this whole initiative. Right on, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Sai asks, can time uh, can time period be extended for this case? Are you asking for this case uh, in terms of like the this initial MIP Sai, or are you talking about? Yeah, may, maybe just elaborate a little bit on the question. I think I think that is what Sai is asking, right? Time period. Yeah. So, so can time percent? period be extended for the this initial MIP framework? So for the for the timing poll, I believe that's that's what uh, they're asking. Okay, so yeah, the the timing poll, yeah, okay, uh, the timing poll is either to proceed with the governance poll to actually ratify these MIPS or to extend the time for competing proposals to be proposed or review to be to keep on con continuing essentially. So it'd be a month period in which there would be more review, uh, more proposals to basically replace the ones that are in, in place. So yeah, uh, it'd be a month period and then there would be another a poll to decide. Basically, if the sentiment in the community is that we need more time on this, the, that poll is going to be the signal. Yeah, it's basically just gauging whether the timing is right for getting these approved or not. Right on. Cool. And Kurt had a question in the forum about um, for pure process MIPS, uh, is the governance uh, cycle necessary? Can you talk about the ratification of process MIPS via governance? Let me just check the comment. Was it on MIP0 itself? Yeah, uh, here's a link. Uh, oh, yeah, there. Number 10. Do we plan on putting some smart contract on chain that stores the names and content? Of approved MIP MIPs 
with governance voting on what goes into that smart contract. Yeah, those are some good thoughts. Uh, at this point, I mean, no worries, I mean, you know I definitely have to consider this more heavily, and I'm. I'll probably reply to him later this afternoon, but I have to digest this a little more. I think he has some really good points for sure. Cool. No worries. Charles, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, for the governance cycle, I was wondering, uh, what's the why have an inclusion poll and governance poll, and like what purpose does the inclusion poll serve? So are you basically saying that they are redundant? Yeah, or I'm seeing there's an inclusion poll, then a governance poll, and then executive vote outlined in MIP three. Like, why? Why do all? Why do you need three votes there? I mean, in general, I think having multiple stages of vetting and um, getting the community's consensus is is important. Uh, understanding or in practice, uh, figuring out what is the optimal amount of that um, will only be done through iteration. The idea of the governance poll is um, basically having another kind of tier of vetting um, to make sure that this proposal should be included or not, or, um, um, or if it should go through. Uh, I, I know I've gotten a lot of feedback with respect to that same comment. Um, so I, I think in general, it will be done through understanding if it's too much or too less and uh, iterating on that um, through making amendments or changes, or maybe maybe you never know, this could be the perfect uh, way to do it. But in general, I think that comment is very valid and we can maybe ex experiment with removing one of them. But um, I think actually using it in practice first may be um, an important kind of signal to changing it, but I mean, I'm open to other suggestions as well. I'm not closed-minded. Sweet, thank you. All right, so <clears throat> we're about 40 minutes into the hour. Uh, I'm gonna use the the remaining 20 minutes to kind of go over uh, what's been going on in MakerDAO for this week. So Charles, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, this was wonderfully uh, informative. Uh, both to me and I'm, I'm sure uh, to a lot of the people listening. Uh, if people do have feedback, where's the best place to give it? On the forums, right? Yeah, so if you have any initial feedback, uh, please propose it on the forums. If, you, if that initial feedback turns into something that you really want to propose as a change, you feel very strongly about, please make a uh, pull request on GitHub, um, or you can ask myself to do it if you are not familiar with GitHub. Um, it's it's really important to get as much feedback as possible from everyone at this period of time so we can iterate and make it suit everyone else and make people agree so yeah forums github so so quick clarify question you told me long for wisdom already submitted some uh, pull requests with uh, with the suggested changes that uh, people in the forum voted on uh, if somebody's coming in and looking at one of these mips uh, if uh, at what point are they looking at maybe, I guess, the most recent version of it? So the most recent version will always be on GitHub. And you can see the changes directly on GitHub, which is why it's so nice. Uh, it's very transparent with the changes that occur. Okay. Um, I'll try to keep maintaining the discourse version as it's pretty much in the same formatting language. But the GitHub one will always be the most up to date. It might be good to just throw the link to uh to the to the github version yeah. right at the top for each yeah. one yeah yeah i was gonna comment that but it was starting to make a whole bunch of noise in the forums <laughs> so yeah. saved a couple for today yeah all right cool no doubt well all right hopefully uh we get to see uh this awesome community self-organizing and making this whole process uh smooth as butter uh so that we can get some collateral on board it so we could expand the system. And so ultimately uh, this whole thing can, uh, can pilot itself, right? So thank you so much for coming on, Charles. Uh, and I'm yeah, thank gonna- you.
Yeah, no problem. So I'm going to share my screen uh, and kind of go through things uh, a bit line by line because there is quite quite a lot of stuff and it might be helpful for you guys to just uh, read along. It's pretty short. Uh, here is a link to the agenda if you want to click through to any of these links. Uh, but uh, as the uh, as the format dictates, I'm going to go through governance first. So governance, uh, a lot of stuff has been going on in governance uh, this week. Uh, I guess uh, one of the first things I want to mention is that uh, the interim governance facilitator, Rich Brown, uh, exercised his judgment to actually pause the next compensation poll about what reimbursed funds will be denominated in. Uh, the Previous compensation poll uh, passed with an uh, overwhelming amount of yeses. Uh, and uh, a part of the uh, condition for what would happen if it passed with yes was that the next poll would be about uh, what they would be denominated in. Uh, he wrote a, a really great uh, uh, forum post. So read it uh, to understand why he's putting it on pause, because there are uh, several concerns about procedure, consensus, planning, uh, and feasibility. So uh, he's looking for feedback from the, the MKR uh, holder community. So check that out. Uh, besides that, a executive vote was passed on April 9th, uh, earlier uh, or mid late last week. Uh, six days uh, it was up before it was actually passed. Uh, and uh, it did a couple of things. So it lowered the USDC stability fee from 16% to 12%. Uh, uh, this is partly due to a lot of the community's concerns around the peg and, uh, and reducing that stability fee, uh, I believe uh, part of the motivation was passed uh, to help increase dial liquidity uh, to bring the peg down to its target rate of a dollar. Uh, the Executive vote also raises the stability fee from seven, uh, the size stability fee from seven and a half percent to eight uh, percent. This is kind of a minor change, uh, almost seemingly random and insignificant because of uh, the planned shutdown that uh, may be happening on the, I believe it's the twenty fourth, or or the twenty. Yeah, I believe it's the twenty fourth, uh, if not the twenty seventh. But my dates are getting a little bit hairy in my head. Uh, and then also it lowered the Psi to die migration contract debt ceiling to zero. So this is uh, maybe the most important change of the executive vote that passed on April 9th. Uh, the reason for this change was because it was step one to uh, actually shutting down the single collateral die uh, version of uh, MakerDAO. Uh, and the reason this is necessary is because uh, there's currently three point something million uh, Psy sitting in this migration contract inside of MakerDAO, uh, inside of the multi-collateral DAI uh, protocol. Uh, and when emergency shutdown happens, all of that Psy actually becomes a uh, $1 uh, claim on ETH uh, based on whatever the Oracle price was at the time of shutdown. So this, uh, this, uh, sh this bringing of the debt ceiling to zero essentially stopped the ability for Psy holders to uh, convert their Psy uh, at par to DAI. Uh, people can still go from DAI back into Psy. So, uh, and likewise, people can still convert uh, or migrate their CDPs into vaults. Uh, the only thing that this changes is that uh, people cannot change Psy into DAI at par. Uh, and this is important because uh, if the protocol has a significant amount of psi at the time of shutdown, uh, it actually carries over that uh, volatility risk since psi will no longer be uh, a stable coin, but will rather be a claim. It will be perfectly correlated, not maybe not perfectly, but very correlated to ETH. Uh, and so this is uh, currently one of the main things that's that's uh, that's a topic of important conversation in the governance community. Uh, and so yeah. Uh, I highly recommend you guys uh, and gals uh, tune into Thursday's risk and governance call. Uh, I believe that this is going to be uh, one of the major topics of conversation. Uh, <clears throat> there is another executive vote out right now. Uh, it's uh, It has mixed sentiment uh, from what I'm seeing in the community, but the proposal is to raise the USDC stability fee back up from 12% to 16%. Uh, it raises the size stability fee from 8% to 8.5%. Uh, 
Uh, it raises the die, okay, Ethan Bat uh, vault stability fees from half a percent to one percent, uh, and uh, and if the DSR spread stays at half a percent, that would mean also that the DSR goes to half a percent. Uh, and so yeah, um, the main uh, reason why I say the sentiment is mixed about this is because uh, the DAI is still trading above a dollar, and this would actually be, uh, in theory, antithetical to the goal of getting it to a dollar. So there's uh, there's currently 99,000 approximate uh, MKR sitting on uh, the current governing proposal, which is the one that passed on April 9th, uh, and only about 30,000 sitting on this one. Uh, so so yeah, so that's what's going on right now. Um, as of yesterday, uh, noon Eastern Standard Time, uh, a new set of uh, governance polls uh, was la were launched. Uh, this high stability fee adjustment, uh, which is a weekly poll, uh, was launched. It's currently winning at 8.5%, which is a vote for, uh, I believe, uh, a change, uh, an increase by half, uh, half a percent. The die stability fee adjustment poll is up uh, and currently uh, the winning option is half a percent, so uh, it, they're voting to keep the rates as they are. The bi-weekly DSR spread is actually uh, happening this week, so uh, the current winning option is actually a lowering of the spread from 50 basis points to, uh, to uh, 25 basis points. And this is interesting because it actually would imply uh, uh, a raise of the DSR from 0% to, uh, to a quarter of a percent. Uh, to those 25 basis points. Uh, and this is interesting because uh, uh, even just from like a sentiment and community perspective, uh, a 0% DSR was super important uh, uh, monetary policy measure that was taken by governance in order to help the die peg. Uh, and so I think, uh, well, actually, I don't, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. But uh, currently the winning option is uh, a quarter of a percent. Uh, the summary of the risk and governance call was uh, delayed due to a Zoom bombing incident. So uh, apologies for that. We're going to be getting the summary up uh, within the next day or two. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I think I'm actually missing a governance poll. Yeah, I'm missing the USDC uh, stability uh, fee poll. So I'm just going to uh, quickly... Out there, yeah, accidentally missed it. My bad, but yeah, generally speaking, also a weekly poll to adjust the stability fee for uh, USDC and the current winning option. As my page loads on my other window, uh, is drum roll please, uh, ten percent. So, uh, so actually, uh, a further lowering by two percent of the USDC stability fee. So. Uh, that's interesting. These uh, these polls all conclude on uh, on Thursday, right before the governance and risk call. So uh, Thursday, 5 p.m. UTC, they will conclude. So there's still another two days of voting on these. All right. So uh, I kind of mentioned this thread every time, uh, just for people who might be new. Uh, governance at a glance is a is a community maintained uh, thread that kind of links to all the relevant forum threads that are going on right now. Uh, I usually highlight a, a few of the more interesting ones. Uh, uh, and one of them that I highlighted and that I want to kind of make a call out to, to the community in general is uh, Long for Wisdom's uh, submission of uh, a, a token collateral application for the ETH DAI Uniswap liquidity token. So uh, this is super interesting. And, and a lot of people in the community are, are expressing uh, a bit of frustration at the slow, pro uh, slow process of getting collateral onboarded, and so, uh, and so, I was asked to uh, put out a call for uh, people who are interested in spearheading collateral applications to go ahead and start submitting them. And uh, uh, in the interim, you can follow uh, MIP six and seven to understand how to do that. Uh, and uh, actually, they're linked here in the agenda. So feel free to, to read through them and check them out. But uh, this is a, a really cool community-led thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, and so yeah, uh, that's the gist uh, in terms of governance. Although there is there are a few other things I want to mention uh, 
actually down here in the notable threads uh, in terms of community sentiment around some things, uh, but I'll get to it in, in about a, a minute or two. So partnerships, integrations, grants, uh, Redeem officially offers DAI. They are a peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange that lets you trade gift cards for crypto. Uh, pretty unique idea. Uh, a bunch of highlighted uh, threads and posts from the foundation. Uh, we released a guide to DAI stats. So if you're ever interested in understanding kind of what each of these wonderful numbers represents. Uh, this is a, a brief overview of, uh, of yeah, how to understand DAI stats. Uh, we also posted uh, top 10 use cases and benefits of the DAI stablecoin for people who are uh, researching stablecoins, uh, new users and whatnot uh, that's directed towards. Uh, and then kind of, yeah, the major, the major one is the first 13 maker improvement proposals uh, to further decentralization of MakerDAO. Uh, and yeah, this is kind of the the big the big one that we're all here for and thinking about and talking about uh, because it really is the next step for the protocol. Uh, and so yeah, and, and I linked all of them here. I'm not going to go through them, uh, but yeah, a little reminder here to make a special call to submit applications. Uh, all right, so some highlights from the community. Uh, Andy's uh, MIP process flowchart uh, was uh, uh, was posted. It's uh, it's super comprehensive, uh, so definitely check it out if you're into visualizations uh, and flowcharts. Uh, Dex Blue uh, launched a DeFi app usage survey, and uh, this was in partnership with MakerDAO, Argent, Claro, Synthetics, Uniswap, Ren, and Kyber. I think that uh, feedback from uh, users is super important for uh, the design and, and building of DeFi apps. So if you do have some time, uh, I'm sure that your feedback would be greatly appreciated on these uh, to help uh, pretty much everybody uh, build better products uh, that suit the users a lot better. Uh, and also as part of the survey, they're actually giving away some stuff. So they're giving away <clears throat> some swag uh, and even branded, uh, and even A, I think that's a single branded Ledger Nano S for, for the lucky somebody. Uh, so yeah, check that out. Uh, some developer creations, uh, some updates. This week, um, DeFi Saver introduced Automation V2, uh, and they are utilizing flash loans, uh, and uh, and also they are supporting uh, the next Oracle price update. So, uh, so I guess I'll quickly read through these points because I put them here uh, so I could better summarize this. But uh, DeFi Saver Automation, it uh, in general, it's an automated management system. Uh, uh, to increase or decrease the leverage of your vault as the price of underlying collateral assets change. So effectively, you could uh, yeah, get automatic leveraging and liquidation protection, uh, and all you have to do is kind of configure it to your vault. And this is the fourth iteration, so uh, their team is hard at work at making this uh, a better and better product for their users. Uh, and actually, I believe that they uh, currently have over 290 uh, individual vaults uh, being protected by this uh, automation tool. Uh, and yeah, so this this iteration is one that could react to the next price update uh, and include support for the new flash loan features. Uh, and what it means by next price updates is uh, if the next price update in MakerDAO moves your position below the configured threshold, automation will now be able to protect your CDP even before the actual update goes through into the Oracle. So in uh, on Black Thursday, there was this kind of issue where uh, the Oracle price jumped, uh, and it jumped way past people's configured thresholds, uh, and it liquidated them before the liquidation protection had a chance to actually uh, do anything to save their position. So it failed. Uh, and so if they were able to read the next price in queue uh, for the uh, on the Oracle, uh, they would have had that. Uh, one hour Oracle delay to actually pad or or do leverage or uh, or protect the, really the the position. So so yeah, really cool uh, improvement for that product. Big fan of DeFi Saver. Uh, <clears throat> some articles and papers I want to highlight. Uh, Mitote's A Maker Perspective, uh, which is an introductory paper. Uh, it's going to be a series of reflections on scientific governance. Uh, Mitote is uh, a longtime community member uh, of MakerDAO, and he 
is kind of applying the idea of um, organizational psychology and, and, and a lot of other interesting uh, academic stuff to thinking about scientific governance through through that lens, um, and thinking about MakerDAO through that lens. So highly, uh, highly worth a read, uh, check it out. Uh, and then I, I saw this uh, post through Twitter by Stefan uh, Ionescu about stability without pegs. And, uh, and this is largely an article about what used to be uh, called the TRFM, the target rate feedback mechanism, which was a part of the original design and uh, thinking behind uh, the maker protocol uh, and uh, and Nikolai who is uh, I guess uh, the ar architect basically like the co-founder on a technical level of the maker protocol he dubbed them reflex bonds uh, and uh, and the author of this article uh, rolls with the idea and presents the idea of, uh, of a reflex bond and actually argues that a reflex bond would be a really interesting collateral to help uh, to help die be stable. So, yeah, uh, I didn't read through the article too deeply, but I definitely have it on my reading list. And uh, if you're interested in in that, uh, give it a read. Uh, oh yeah. So really quickly, uh, Akiva makes a great point. There is a risk and governance call that it's starting right now. So uh, no hard feelings if you jump off. Uh, if uh, if you're interested in the risk and governance call link. I'll actually post it right now if I could get a hold of it. Give me one sec. Yeah, so here it is. Uh, yeah, and there's a special password, so I will. Yeah, I think you could just click the link and it should be, you should be able to get in there. So it's actually talking about the, uh, uh, the uh, risk model for MakerDAO that the risk team has been working on. So check it out. Uh, and yeah, uh, I'm going to quickly wrap up here, but uh, some notable threads. Yeah, no problem, Charles. Uh, some notable threads. Uh, I haven't upgraded my migrated CDP to the multi-collateral die version. What will happen on April 24th? Fourth, uh, a lot of interesting comments on that thread. Uh, shutdown of single collateral die gives us too little time. Uh, this is also kind of uh, a sentiment that has been echoed by several community members, but the top comment on that thread, I think makes a great argument. Uh, it's a little disingenuous to say that there's too little time because there's actually, uh, migration has been live and encouraged for the last five months. Uh, and uh, it wasn't like an abrupt decision to shut down. This has been a long running conversation. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and then there's a number of threads about helping the DIPEG. So uh, a lot of people arguing for a lowering of the USDC stability fee. But of course, that's kind of coming up against the argument of what is the purpose of the USDC uh, vault? Uh, wasn't it adopted as a uh, emergency liquidity source? Don't we want it to have a high stability fee? Uh, and uh, what does this do for, for DAI uh, fundamentally? Uh, even philosophically. So there's uh, a number of threads there like that, all with interesting comments. Uh, and yeah, and then there's a number of uh, videos and podcasts uh, uh, from Rune, from uh, from Greg DePrisco, who's our head of BD, uh, and from uh, Alex. And actually, I missed one, but there's also uh, Mariano Conti's uh, essay that he read on Laura Shins Unchained. I think actually that came out this morning. So uh, I'll post the link in the agenda to that. Uh, and with that, uh, only two minutes over time. Thank you guys so much for being on the call. Uh, and this is going to be posted to YouTube as usual. So uh, yeah, thanks. Hope hopefully this was uh, this was valuable to you guys. And see you next week.